near mint condition, the home of collected oh, edition. That cover is so awesome. Absolute format is the best way to own this store. Time to empty those wallets and fill those shelves. Happy Monday, all you mentees. Uncanny Omar here from Nearman Condition, the home of Collected Editions. And welcome to your advanced look at the Sigil Omnibus. What is it? When does this take place in the Marvel Universe? Well, I will be explaining all of that in this video. So, let's go ahead and get started. And welcome back, everybody. Now, before I go any further, a big thank you to David Gabriel and the fine folks at Marvel for sending us an advanced copy of this omnibus. This omnibus is due out in the direct market and book market on December 19th or 20th, depending on where you get your books. Now, what we're looking at here is the standard edition cover. This is the one that's supplied by Ben Lay. On the left-hand side is your direct market cover, and that one is supplied by Scott Eaton. And that direct market cover is only available at places like your local comic book store or CheapGraphicNovels.com, WaltzComicShop.com, ComicsBugle.com, Dying Breed Collectors, Organic Price Books, BDCosmos.com, InStock Trades, and Tales of Wonder and places like that. And yes, there is a difference in the spine. You have Sam on the standard edition and Thru Sarud, I think that's how you pronounce his name, Loser on the spine of the direct market. But everything else underneath the dust jacket is the same. So let's take a closer look at the cover here. We have the Sigil logo there, the Marvel logo, the CrossGen logo, which looks very similar to that Sigil that Sam is wearing on that cover, but more on that here in a little bit. Dixon, Kessel, Wade, Eagle Sham, Eaton, and Lay. And then the spine of the book, which we looked at a little bit earlier, but Marvel Omnibus, Sigil, Dixon, Kessel, Wade, Eagle Sham, Eaton, Lay, and Sam down there. And then the covers of the books that are collected in here. Full Epic Saga of Galactic Mercenary, Samadal Ray, or Sam. And the ISBN, latest T Plus, Marvel and Cross Gen logo, what's collected. Uh, the book retails for $125. Let's look at it underneath the dust jacket here. So you have the flaps and a little bio on the creators here on the right-hand side. While over here, you get a little bio, honestly, just on the first issue, not the entire series. Now, this piece, this is drawn by series artist Scott Eaton, and it features three of the main characters. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about the art as we get in here and some names that you may recognize whose early work is going to be found through here. So let's go ahead and start talking about that. We'll be looking at the content, what's collected in here, the page count, the build of the book, and of course, give you the pitch as to what exactly this is. What is CrossGen, in case you're not familiar with any of that? Okay, let's go ahead and crack this omnibus open. We have this orange, almost like a brick color end sheets. The Sigil logo there. And these are all key players throughout this book. And here are are the credits most of this of course written by chuck dixon but barbara kessel and mark wade supplying the first part of the story so you have barbara kessel writing issues 1 through 11 and 20 mark wade doing 11 through 19 then chuck dixon era which is 21 through 42 and then your pencilers and inkers down here ben lay and ray lay i think they were brothers uh you have early work here by steve mcniven kevin sharp scott eaton taking over and then finishing up the series is De uh, del eagle sham uh, you have your colors here, like Will Quintana and J.D. Smith, and then the lettering by Dave Lampier and Troy Pateri, just to name a few. There's a couple of backup stories that are collected through here, and here are the credits for those. Um, like Mark Wade coming back with Tony Bedard to do the Saurian story, and then the cross Gen Chronicles by Mark Wade and the legendary George Pettis on pencils. The cover art and the cross-gen universe created by Mark Alessi and Gina M. Vila. So let's talk a little bit about that here in a second uh, your table of contents so what's collected in here collected in here is sigil 1 through 42 cross chain chronicles number four saurians on natural selection one and two and then material from cross gen chronicles number one the book has 1192 pages so cross gen chronicles you've heard me throw that word around a lot cross gen was a publishing company that came out i believe in the early aughts so it's like 
2000, uh, that it was both Mark Alessi and his cousin Gina Envia, who, by the way, both of them have now passed away. I believe Mark passed away in 2019 and Gina passed away in 2022. Uh, but both of them created this company where you were going to see a lot of writers and artists that you were familiar with, like Jim Chung, Ron Mars, uh, just to name a few, Liam Sharp, they were all going over to cross-gen from the big two. It was like a new booming of the image comics. Uh, there were new comic books that were centered around their own universe, and none of them really overlapped with each other, except there were some that did overlap, including this book, but not to the extent that, oh, you were forced to go out and buy Meridian or any of the other issue or comics that were coming out at that time, but you wanted to because, uh, oh my gosh, it's so encaptivating how they were able to put this universe together. So when both of them formed that company, one of the very first few titles that came out, there were four titles. It was Mystic and Meridian and Scion, and then there was Sigil. This was one of the first titles that launched in, I believe, in July of 2000. And it went all the way to 2003, and then finally when it was public that they went bankrupt and they had to close shop. That was in the early 2004. Then came the Disney acquisition. Before Marvel, they acquired the rights to the sigil, maybe to make movies, TV shows. I'm not really sure. Um, but eventually, since Disney owned the rights to cross-gen, Marvel was able to produce some of the collected editions, and I think they even did some original stories. And that, in a nutshell, <laughs> very, very vague uh, introduction of what the cross-gen universe was. So think about it like a different publishing company, like Image, or Dark Horse Comics, or Vault, or, or Valiant. It's your new universe that has no ties to the Marvel Universe. There wasn't like a big crossover, like the Ultraverse, when they merged with Marvel and had the whole Exiles and all that. So you don't need to have read anything before this, you don't need to read anything after this, but you'll want to because the other thing I'm going to say is that while this feels like a complete story, there's so much more. There are some things that they finally um, solve by the end of this, but it could definitely continue into a bigger space saga, and I'll compare it to something that people are familiar with here in a second. But first, let's talk about this story. What, what are you even looking at? So the first story arc, the first 10 issues, were all written by Barbara Kessel and drawn by Ben and Ray Lay. And at the very beginning, we have narration boxes here. Seem to get the idea that these are probably gods and they're pulling some strings and they're both arguing who should be the bearer of the sigil. And then we slowly get to meet our cast of characters. This is Samadal Ray, and everybody calls him Sam. And he was a ex-soldier from the planetary union this is his lovely sidekick or somebody that was a uh, in the military with him and we get to find out more about that when mark way takes over the book and that is roya centaur so both of them are kind of like taking a break from being mercenaries uh to come to the world of tanapel now little do they know their worlds are about to change because there are people that are going after Sam because of everything that he was part of during his military days. And a stranger, a hooded stranger, marks him with a sigil. Now, he doesn't know what exactly that is. But in this planet, they do meet a couple of people. They meet this young man named Jemerick uh, Mir, who will find out who he is in a little bit, or what his role in all this is. Plus, he's also a man of mystery. And we also meet this young lady right here, and that is Saniyati Oribata, I believe is how you pronounce her name. Maybe not. Now, as I mentioned, you have these beings that are coming for revenge to try to get Sam. And they're known as the Saurians. So they come in here and they try to capture him. And what they end up doing is instead of capturing Sam, they end up killing his friend Roya. And when this sigil was put on Sam, he didn't know exactly what it was. But we find out at the end when he's trying to take her to the ship and he finds out that she is dying, that this sigil lets out this burst of energy that destroys a bunch of Saurian ships around them. And that's where the first issue ends. That's, that's the cliffhanger. It's like, what exactly is this sigil? 
And who are these two people that just joined Roya and Sam on their spaceship? By the way, their spaceship has a really cool name. It's the Bitter Luck. So then we jump to the uh, Cross-Gen Chronicles. This is mapped perfectly because this is where he wakes up uh, and he's thinking about Roya and what exactly is going on. What does the sigil mean? And then we jump over to issue number two. So you'll see the material from some uh, the issues that are not part of the ongoing sigil are collected in between issues. Perfectly mapped. Now, as you read through here, you find out that the sigil has a lot more power than just letting out bursts of energy. For example, one of the things that the sigil did without Sam or anybody on the ship even knowing is that the sigil made Roya and took her essence and put it on the ship, on the spaceship of the Bitter Luck. So now she's part of the ship. I forgot to mention the fifth member, and that is... Uh, Oh, trouble. That's his, that's what they call him. Because they were over here in this planet uh, betting on these races with these little creatures. And meanwhile, by the way, this is early work of Steve McNiven. This, this uh, piece right here. You may not even recognize his work at all, but he draws the sixth issue of Sigil. So as we find out by reading through here that this Saurian warlord, this uh, leader, his name is... Uh, he's the guy on the spine... I'm going to try to pronounce it again. Plusarud is the way that I pronounced it. Uh, but he, Sam calls him Loser. He was the one that was behind going and trying to capture Sam uh, because he wants to get revenge. So this is a kind of a revenge story for his empire, for all the people that Sam and Roya hurt in the past. Now we get to find out a little bit more about Sam and Roya, who's now part of the spaceship, and later on she becomes a hologram, and later on there's a couple more twists with her story. Uh, we get to find out more about their two new crewmates. Uh, so you have Jemerick Mir. So Jemerick Mir, and by the way, I was confused at first because they look so much alike, especially when Ben was on the book for the first five issues. It's not until Scott Eaton comes aboard that, believe it or not, those are the two characters. This is Sam, and this is Jemerick Mir. But at the first five issues, I was confused as to who's who. If it wasn't for the sigil on Sam's chest, or the guy that's bursting out all this power, I, I was a little bit lost, not even going to lie. Uh, now, where was I? Oh, we get to find out a little bit more about his fellow travelers. We get to find out that Je Jemerick is a Tanapali security chief. And he still has a lot more secrets. And then we find out that Zaniati is an escaped wife of a sultan. And the sultan will play a role in this because he wants her back badly. And of course there's the whole mystery of the sigil and this intergalactic war between all these different planets. Now, even though they're humanoids or uh, humans, they do come from a place called Gaia. It's not quite Earth, because later on you get to meet characters that do come from Earth, and it's a little bit different. And I mentioned earlier that this does have ties to other of the cross-gen titles that were going on at the time, and that's mainly due to the fact that he is bearing a sigil. And in the cross-gen universe, there are sigil bearers throughout different series. You'll find some in the Meridian series. Uh, you'll find some in the Brath series, which actually starts off here, I think. I never read Brath. That wasn't one of my titles that I did read, but I did read Meridian, and I remember Sephi and Meridian, for example, being one of the five sigil bearers, and it has ties to this. I just didn't know how close they were until I read this into in its entirety, because to come clean, I never read this in its entirety. This was only collected in a series of three and i want to say four maybe four trade paperbacks i don't think four i ever even got um so it never finished i think i went all the way up to like halfway for the series because this went all the way to issue 42 and i think i went all the way maybe 24 was the last issue that i read maybe uh, i do remember the early chuck dixon era so this to me felt like reading it for the first time i didn't remember any of the characters names i vaguely remember what the sigil was so it was a really nice Intro reintroduction rather to this wonderful space opera because this does feel like a wonderful mashup of things that i've loved in uh, over the years whether it's farscape or star wars or lensman for anybody that read the books or watched the anime from the late 80s eh? um, or cobra far a little bit of firefly in there just because of the friendship that these uh four have 
And especially when Roya becomes a part of the ship and when she's able to become a hologram. And then later on she learns that she has her own little abilities. And I really like the villain too. The Oh my gosh, I'm going to try to pronounce... You know what? No, I'm going to call him Loser from now on. But you all know, every time I say Loser, yeah, I'm talking about Fusarud. I really like how complex he is because he's doing this at first for vengeance. He loses the fight, so he has to go and tell his mother, who is queen of this kingdom that he could not get revenge so eventually they strip away his badges his ranking and this is a case of well <laughs> now what do i do you know the empire doesn't want me my own people don't even want me i guess i'll join forces with these guys and try to find out what exactly is the sigil and what does it have to do with our kingdom and our goddess it is really cool because it's not just the mythology uh, behind it that i enjoyed but it's a different uh, races of aliens that you'll see through here. Now, I really like Barbara Kessel's start. Mark Wade does an awesome introduction of, or character study rather, so let's get there, of the two main characters, Roya and Sam. But it's before they were kicked off the military. And you get to find out exactly why they were kicked off or why they left the military and how they became friends in their first mission. So this is a flashback that features the artwork of George Pettis, and it's all written by Mark Wade. It was right before he took over the book. And when he takes over the book, it changes a little bit in tone. But honestly, it's not until Chuck Dixon takes over the book that it feels like, oh, this is huge. Like, for the most part, when it comes to Barbara Kessel and when it came to Mark Wade, the way this was written is let's focus on Gaia, let's focus, but not really show Gaia, but just, you know, what's going on in this intergalactic war, and let's mainly focus on the Saurian Empire. When Chuck Dixon takes over the book, it's like, no, there's a bigger intergalactic war going on, so we're going to show different races and different planets through here. Eventually, even going to Gaia. Now, this did end with issue number 42. And I'm not going to talk about where it goes, but I'm sure, you know, like I, most people probably want to know, is it complete though? Can I enjoy it? Yes, you can completely enjoy it. But I'm going to go ahead and tell you that I'm comparing this to something like Star Wars A New Hope. Think watching Star Wars A New Hope, introducing yourself to these new characters. This war has been going on for ages. And sure, there could have been prequels before. As a matter of fact, the... Here, let me actually get there. Zarion's Unnatural Selection takes place a few hundred years before the start of this book. So it's only a two-issue miniseries written by Mark Wade and by Tony Bedard. And it's the story of the Saurian warrior uh, Tarak and how he's fighting off a bunch of humans. That's pretty much it. Uh, but I was saying is that this feels like... This is the extras in the... Let's look at the extras while I talk about this. Uh, this is the extras in the back here, like Wizard Magazine. But it feels like Star Wars A New Hope. So think of like introducing yourself to all these new characters. And it ends on a cliffhanger that kind of wraps up Star Wars A New Hope. But you also want more, and that's what it felt like. And it felt like they were going to do more. And I don't know when Marvel brought back the single issues, if they were planning on bringing back the cross-gen universe or not. Uh, because it, this does tie into not just Meridian and Brat, but also the negation storyline, especially towards the end, towards the um, issues of Mark Wade, Or, I'm sorry, Chuck Dixon. And I didn't show off any of the artwork here by uh, uh, Del Eaglesham. So you do get some early artwork by Del Eaglesham uh, before he took over the JSA. And then I wanted to show off the Steve McNiven artwork right after Ben Lay. Um which is in issue number six. So yes, this does feel like episode four of something huge, and there wasn't an episode five or an episode three. Uh, but there could have been. This is the Steve McNiven issue. So much different than his stuff in Civil War, or even the stuff when he was doing the Fantastic Four series, uh, or Old Man Logan. A lot different. It could be due to the inker, but man, did he change up his style so much. Uh, and then there's still Eagle Sham, but let's go back to the extras. So, you know, think of it like that. Think of it like seeing a Star Wars chapter. So you do kind of get a wrap-up of a lot of the storylines, but there's so much more that they could have expanded on. 
it's a wonderful space opera that honestly i wish they would have kept going i didn't even talk about some of the other characters that show up through here uh like the sultan uh who has ties to roya and wants her back it's, there's some tropey things that happen uh, especially with the ladies but then some unexpected things sometimes your allies turn into enemies and then vice versa the enemies turn into your allies and i enjoyed that i enjoyed when i'm pleasantly surprised when things take a turn and there's interviews here with chuck dixon scott eaton so you probably saw the difference right between the art of ben lay and his brother and the art of scott eaton when it came to ben lay that's why i was getting a little bit confused because the two main uh, male leads look similar but that's only for the first five issues and honestly there's so many new names that are hard to pronounce these okay so these are the trade paperbacks i was talking about there's original art but these are the trades i had that one and two for sure and i had the one with loser so maybe they did publish a fourth one okay i, I did not have that one and this is a forward by mark alessi i the cross-gen universe the cross-gen publishing company is an era of comics that i do miss i remember how happy a lot of the creators were at first when uh this was a company i think it was based in florida if i'm not mistaken that you know we're paying creators not just a good amount of money but also giving them things like health insurance sadly yeah they they did go under in 2004 and that's when disney acquired them but this is the oh this is the um i think this is the script right here yeah the plot and script for sigil 43 so there were plans to keep going with the story but this is the script and plot for issue 43 that was never made who knows maybe one day hmm? never say never uh okay let's take a look at the binding 1192 pages printed at the mega print printer and my goodness look at that eye baby huge making the so many spread pages through here look amazing i mean all the way from the beginning you can see the sewn binding uh, so no real gutter loss at all and uh to the middle so let's actually talk because there's a lot of darkness because we are talking about space travel but um there is a lot of darkness through here Oh, and the other thing I was going to say, I think this stuff was released digitally because the cleanup on this is amazing. There's not the smudges that sometimes you see or, or a little bit of this. Uh, when, whenever we have some bad scans from that late 90s, early aughts art, I think this looks amazing. Uh, so there's minimal bleed through happening. The paper stock is the same that Megaprint uses. I did miss their art that uh, ben and ray's art has that anime flair to it so it's mainly on the light pages or white pages that you're going to see some bleed through but that's it if you have any questions yeah let me know because this was a fun unexpected book and a nice break from superheroes even though the dude is like super powered goku uh still you know you throw in some battle star some firescape a little bit of star wars here a dash of lensman like i said babylon 5 Ooh, you're in for a treat that as they say is that if you're interested in purchasing this omnibus don't forget to check out our sponsors if you're in europe and you're interested in buying these books definitely check out walt's comic shop in berlin germany they have the cheapest pre-order prices flat shipping rate of 12 euros for all eu countries Emails answer within 24 hours, waltzcomicshop.com, and you can use the code near mint condition at checkout and get free shipping for all EU countries with your first order over 40 euros. That's Waltz Comic Shop, your reliable source for omnis and premium collected editions in Europe. Ding! Cheapgraphicnovels.com, your online home for graphic novels and collected editions up to 50% off cover price. They have excellent shipping and prompt and helpful service. Check out their bargain deals for up to 90% off cover price. And don't forget that CGN also takes pre-orders. That way you don't miss out on the hottest releases. And they are currently running a special promotion for you minties. If you're a first-time customer, after receiving your order confirmation email, reply back to that email and let them know Near Mint Condition sent you their way. They will then apply a free shipping promotional credit to your next order in the US. Cheap Graphic Novels, your source for the hottest books with the kind of deep discount, quality shipping, and customer service that will keep you coming back for more.
And that was the content, the page count, and build of this omnibus. Let me know in the comments down below if you have any questions, if you've never read any cross-gen title, or if you're a huge fan of cross-gen and hope that we have a lot more of cross-gen collected in omnibus format. Any questions, leave them down below. Smash that like button on the way out. Big thank you to our patrons for making videos like this possible. Everyone, stay healthy and safe out there. Much love.